Okay, hello everyone and welcome to our June Remisa seminar. So before I get started, uh, before we get started, I'd like to acknowledge the Indigenous owners of the land that I'm on today. So normally I'd be at Monash University in Victoria uh, and our universities are on the land of the people of the Kulin Nation. But today, uh, currently Victoria's in uh, lockdown, so I'm at home and that's on Warren Dirdry land. So pay my respects to their elders, past, present and emerging. Indigenous Australians are the oldest continuous culture and we're the first Australian earth and environmental scientists. We have a lot to learn from them and from their deep knowledge of the Australian land and environment. The Wamisa seminar series is about showcasing the amazing work of women in earth and environmental science in Australasia. As well as the live seminars, we also have collated uh, recordings from seminars that are hosted by other organisations and we've put them uh, all in one spot on our Wamisa webpage and on our YouTube channel. So you can check those out if you want to see some more fantastic seminars. The live series is on the first Wednesday of every month and so our July uh, seminar will be on July 7. You can sign up as a member of Wamisa to get a notification of upcoming seminars or you can follow us on Twitter. So today's seminar is going to be presented by Dr. Rochelle Kerner. So Rochelle is an energy geoscientist making contributions in the industry, applied academia and nonprofit sectors. She's a geological specialist applying her skills in salt and sedimentology to the renewable sector. Rochelle um, is passionate about the energy transition, diversity, equity and inclusion and science communication. So without further delay, I will hand over to you, Rochelle. Thank you so much, Melanie, for the introduction. It's been great to meet you and thank you everyone for being here. I really appreciate uh, the time that you're going to take out of your day to listen to my presentation. So what I'll be talking about with you today is um, some steps that myself and a group of women took within the American Association of Petroleum Geologists. And these are steps that we um, did to create and promote Gender, gender equity and diversity within the AAPG society. Let's see here. I would just like to acknowledge uh, the co-authors for this work. So it's a very long list of people that work with uh, the AAPG Women's Network. A lot of these women are in academia and then also quite a number of them are work for various types of energy and oil companies. So they were really supportive and instrumental in uh, getting this piece of work done. Additionally, I would like to thank the professional societies that I have worked with um, to that also provided data. So the main society is the Association, American Association of Petroleum Geologists. And then we also worked with the Geological Society of America, the American Geophysical Union, and then as part of the peer review process, um, I'm also working with um, the Women in Earth and Environmental Sciences. So you guys that are hosting this. And then also uh, some of those people are part of the Geological Society of Australia. So we'll be highlighting uh, some of their work from the peer reviews. And then also the European Geophysical Union has donated some of their data as well. And then lastly, we would like to thank uh, Dr. Christine L. Williams. So I'm not sure if you've seen this, this has been posted on LinkedIn. I think it was about two weeks ago now. She is just publishing a book that's called uh, Gaslighted. And this is a book highlighting her research that's been going on for over a decade. And this is basically how the oil and gas industry shortchanges uh, their women geoscientists. And uh, she actually, when we kicked off this project just about a year ago now, a year exactly, she met with us as a group several times, about four or five different times and made sure that we had um, all the appropriate literature and we were up to speed on her latest work. So she is a professor in sociology at the University of Texas, Austin. She is um, considered to be at the top of her career. She's very uh, well-respected within the sociology community. And then um, if you're at all interested in this book, if this has any application to you at all, it is available on amazon.com. 
uh, in hard and paperback copy. I'm hoping she'll do an audible at some point because I really like listening to, to books rather than reading them. And then just to give you a little bit of background about me, um, I have a BS in geology where I completed research in California, China, Turkey, and Japan. And then from there, I went and did a master's in geology. And this is when I began my work in the Flinders and the Willowen Ranges in South Australia. So I started coming to Australia. It was actually the summer of 2009 it was the first time I spent three months out in the Flinders in the Willowens. And then after I finished my master's, I went to Royal Dutch Shell in Houston, and I was a petroleum exploration geoscientist. Uh, that was a great role. I worked in the offshore Gulf of Mexico and then also in the Southeast Caribbean, sort of South America, Trinidad region out to Barbados, uh, all exploration roles. And then I took a academic leave of absence from Shell and I went uh, back to school and did a PhD in geology. And I went with the same research group and continued the work that I had started in the Flinders. And during that time period, uh, while I was doing my PhD, I also consulted for BP Americas and then also worked at UT Austin within the Bureau of Economic Geology. So another research consortium that studied the same area that I did, which was um, salt sediment interaction. And it's a field, very specialized discipline within um, sedimentology and stratigraphy. From there, uh, so I graduated in December of 2019. I was supposed to come to the University of Adelaide for a postdoc, but unfortunately due to COVID, I didn't make it there before the international border shut. So um, due to my visa situation, I was given an honorary title. And as of right now, um, they're looking into recruiting, but I do not think that it's they're gonna be able to hire me in the near future because of the financial crisis that's going on within the universities within Australia. However, um, I did pick up a role that I'm actually gonna be starting next week, uh, moving across the US, and we'll be starting as a mineral exploration geoscientist for Sandfire Resources America. And Sandfire is actually uh, an Australian company based in Perth. So there was really no connection. Uh, it was a completely different way that I found these people, but I'm really excited to be able to continue work being a geologist. I also started, um, this was more just a community service project um, a podcast. And I actually found out today that I will be re uh, funded for that podcast through the Department of Energy within the US. And then also a side project that I have going on is I'm working to shift my skills in petroleum into renewable energies. So I am working on a part-time online master's, uh, professional master's in renewable energy and sustainability systems. So everything's sort of converging. It was all COVID kind of blew everything up and now it's all kind of coming back together. Thank goodness. And then here's a little bit of background about uh, the relevant uh, nonprofit leadership roles that I've held for oh, about five years now. So this is the board of uh, the AAPG Women's Network. So a lot of these women um, I talk to on a daily basis. So we put together this manuscript and we lead in a bunch of other initiatives that I'll talk about for this talk. Um, so what I did, I started my role sort of being an advocate for women and minorities in 2016, where I founded uh, a local chapter, and this was under the Association for Women Geoscientists umbrella. From there, um, I became a board of a secretary, so the, within the board of directors from 2017 to 2019 for the Association for Women Geoscientists, and then there was um, sort of a pathway where there's a crossover between some of the women that were on the AWG and then the women um, that go to the AAPG. So I was given or asked to do the co-chair role. In addition, uh, because I have lived in El Paso, Texas for the last six years, it's a very heavily about 80 to 90 percent Hispanic population. And I have a lot of friends and connections within uh, the Latina and Latino communities. So because of those connections, I also serve as a liaison member for the GeoLatinas program. Okay, so to get to the point, oops, sorry. So what is the issue? And I'm sure those of you that have participated in some of the literature or have 
um, been a co-author of some of these styles of papers. I'm sure you're fully aware of this, so I don't want to spend too much time on it. But those of you who may be new to this concept, um, this is basically where we're at. Um, this graph is a few years old. But the issue is, is that women are graduating at very high percentages, anywhere between 50, upwards of 73, uh, possibly 75%. Um, they're getting degrees in geosciences. So they're graduating at very high rates. Um, this would be um, at the undergraduate level. This is where this graph comes from. So you can see that we're pretty equal, although 2017, um, you can see that men graduated uh, significantly higher numbers, but generally speaking, women are graduating at significantly high numbers with a geoscience degree. And then what happens is um, as they enter the workforce, those numbers drop way off. So men maintain relatively the same rate that they're graduating, men remain within the geoscience field. But you see that there's a significant drop off of women. So this work basically aims to answer perhaps why uh, this phenomenon is happening. Historically, this phenomenon has been referred to as uh, the leaky pipeline, if you will. Although people who are working on this now actually think that that is maybe not the best term to use. So that term in the literature is being replaced by um, other more robust terminology that I'm not really going to get into because there's all sorts of reasons why they're doing that. So this paper, the goal of this paper is to tackle specifically women within the petroleum geoscience field, why they're leaving. A lot of these, um, actually all these reasons, they do have um, citations. I didn't include it in this because I didn't want to clutter up the presentation, but if you would like any references to anything I say here, please let me know. I can forward you an entire folder within Google Drive full of all of the papers. These um, reasons are a combination of literature and personal experiences that women have that are co-authors of this paper. So when you get up to the very top, the highest ranks, uh, women leadership drops way off. So we call that a lack of visible role models. So if you can't identify with someone um, like you in a place that you want to get to, it can often be really hard to actually get to that place. There are various types of workforce retention issues. Uh, one that I personally have noticed, I don't have any children yet, but I have friends um, that had children and something as simple as a breastfeeding room at their place of employment has not been made available to them. And that can cause a lot of issues uh, for them for various reasons. So things related uh, like that, where women end up leaving when they have children because there is not necessarily a family-friendly environment. Uh, occasionally, there tends to be limited mentors and advisors. So maybe um, the mentors and advisors prefer other demographics uh, to work with because they identify more with those people. Additionally, uh, a lot of times classroom and workplaces tend to be emotionally unsupportive. So you're almost... Um, looked down upon, if you will, for having feelings or expressing emotion of any type. Additionally, there can be gender-based isolation and discrimination. So simply, you didn't get the job because you were a female or what have you, um, because of your sexual orientation, or if you're not, if you don't identify um, with some of the more condom, condom um, gender types. So those are some of the issues. And then also there are bias and nepotunistic hiring and layoff practices. This is especially prevalent within the oil and gas field. Additionally, there has been uh, poor marketing of geoscience programs to minorities and women. There's also tends to be a difference in career goals between men and women. So sometimes, um, you know, what men think are really, really important may not necessarily think what women um, do as being really important. 
So all of these issues can lead to uh, low self-confidence among women and minorities, and this basically just perpetuates the problem. Sometimes people see individuals who are maybe lacking in confidence, um, they may not trust them or give them as much responsibility or opportunity because they think, oh, well, they can't handle it or they sort of take the wrong stance on it instead of maybe lending a helping hand or finding them a mentor to ensure their success. Um, and also, I'm sure this is something that everyone is familiar with, is that women of color experience a double blind or a double jeopardy phenomenon. So they are taxed and, um, if you will, left behind not only for being a woman, but also being a woman of color. Um, I think I already touched on this family and friendly policies. And then um, also what basically what boils down to is women and minorities experience a higher rate of physical, sexual, and emotional abuse within um, their workplaces and within their school environments. And again, this list is a comprehensive list, but it is by no means complete. So the long-term results of um, all these reasons why we lose women within petroleum geology, uh, this generates a bias. So over the length of a woman's career, it will severely limit the, the diversity of the candidate pool for prestigious leadership positions within professional societies, technical and service awards, publication, especially first author publications, um, you really see um, that women drop way off. Also as distinguished lectures. So this is something uh, that we have in the AAPG. It's basically, um, I'm not sure how it's gonna be going forward, but up until COVID, it was where they were given a budget and they flew all over the world and visited all these universities and presented um, a really amazing paper or research topic that they had um, discovered within the petroleum geoscience. It's sort of the apex of one's uh, career within the AAPG professional society. And you rarely see women. And I think there's just a handful of minorities that have actually um, been bestowed this honor. Um, and then lastly, by not earning these awards and positions um, overall and within geological societies, this can greatly impact the overall career progression. So if you think of it, if you are given the opportunity to fly all around the world to present your research, can you imagine the, the jump that your citations would have if you're an academic or even if you're an industry and you're publishing? So imagine um, if you're never actually given that opportunity because you simply don't have the network or all the biases that sort of play into over the life of your career, it's, it's really sad. And, you know, those citations and that exposure, especially in academia, really um, will limit the perhaps the amount of funding you will receive, uh, like in Australia through the ARC. I've seen the statistics uh, for that and um, they're not good at all. So all these things sort of, um, it's a snowball effect. So you sort of get this rolling, you miss out on X, Y, and Z because let's say you decide to have a baby or you know, you're busy taking care of a parent or what have you, which those always usually tend to fall on a woman's shoulders and you miss out on one thing after another. And then before you know it, um, you're just in a short term or contract by contract position, just barely kind of hanging on to your professional career. This I see all the time and it's really unfortunate. Okay, so I've embedded um, some kittens within <laughs> the presentation because I find that this stuff is really heavy. It's actually, um, it, uh, it's been heavy for me to work on. So it's, it's important, I think, that you sort of pause and don't let your mind and yourself get too far down in the weeds just because um, a lot of this stuff is very real and it's very emotional for people and it's also hard for um you know men because they have wives that are going through a lot of this stuff so it's it's not just it's not just women okay so now what we'll do is i will talk you through the data analysis through the aapg data and i'm sure none of this will be very um surprising to anybody who's on this call so that you can see here over on the far left that uh, the executive committee, so within the executive committees, you have like the top tier executive committee that is composed of the, the president, vice president, secretary, editor, what have you. And then from there, you go to an executive com 
a committee consisting of uh, professional affairs. And then you have the Division of Environmental Geosciences and then the Energy and Minerals Division. So you can see that through time, uh, overall, the percentage of women have gone up, which I think is completely reasonable and expected. So um, we're doing okay getting there uh, from 2011 to 2020. And actually in 2020, uh, the executive committee was almost 50-50 for the first time. So they really have been making strides within uh, some of these boards, but you can still see that overall, women are much less than men. This is uh, the overall, the award data. So this is any sort of award within the AAPG Association. And I'll go through those awards a little, like two or three slides down. Uh, there's a whole bunch of them. But basically you can see um, that here from uh, 2011 to 2020, it was 17% uh, were women. And then uh, we actually did have an other gender. So people that we didn't necessarily know their gender or you couldn't tell based off of their name. So it's gone up from 13% to 17%. Um, this, is, this is very challenging, the situation, because a group of people meet um, to make these decisions. So even though women are nominated, at much higher percentages, there's this big event that takes place over several weekends, and I think it's June, that determines award recipients. And this is where things, um, I think, it are really difficult for women in this meeting. It's important to know that there is one award for young people specifically. It's called the Young Professional Exemplary Service Award. It was created in 2017, and this award has been gender and um, ethnic, ethnically balanced. Granted, there's only three years worth of data. Um, again, it just reiterates our point that young people are um, often, it's, it is equal, you know, you are getting a 50-50 split, you are including minorities, um, but it's when you get into the quote unquote, not young professional or um, more senior awards that the rates for women drop way off. And then also one thing to note that within the APG organization, their highest honor, the Sydney Powers Memorial Award, has never been received by a woman. Hopefully that will change. This is a compilation of all the awards within the organization. And you can see here that we broke down um, the number of women to men. And then also we had a few unknowns just because you couldn't tell their gender based off their name or we didn't we weren't able to ever uh, get in contact with them like they passed away or something like that. So you can see that overall um, women are definitely um, on the lower end of this and then one thing just to notice is the place where women are doing okay or well is down here it's the teacher of the year award so teachers women will always or historically have outpaced men and that's the only award which I think it always kind of makes me chuckle and then um also the other award of course that women um are higher in overall is the distinguished service award so this sort of just goes to show that you have women that are spending time um teaching and doing service and that's as far as they get within um this organization uh, there are also a bunch of other things uh, that people within the APG membership can be involved with. So they can be involved within uh, publications, uh, the distinguished lectures, which I was talking about earlier, and then also technical roles. Um, we have uh, instructors and visiting geoscientists. There are editorial boards for uh, their various journals. And then also this is the distinguished lectures. So you can see here that um, editorial boards, women are you know, better, 20%, but then um, the visiting instructors and then also the distinguished lectures, it's only 7% women. I mean, this to me is, especially in this day and age, is just simply unacceptable. And then what we did is we based, um, we made some charts and we compared the percentage of female uh, members to the percentage of female awardees. 
for, yeah, let's see, we only went back to 2014 because before that, some of these societies weren't really collecting data. So just made it difficult. So this graph, when you first look at it, or the series of these graphs may be a little um, overwhelming to comprehend, but basically um, looking at the AAPG at the top, the gray bar is the percentage of women who are members within the society. And then if you see the red bar sitting right below it, that's just saying that the number of women who have received awards is less than the percentage of the female membership within the organization. So the percentage of female membership within the organization should just be a benchmark. I view it as a bare minimum. Um, and you can see that in 2020 that they met that benchmark also in 2017, but otherwise they are not meeting um, that benchmark and that their female uh, membership percentage is only hovering around 20% which is really inadequate considering that women are graduating with degrees in geology or in geoscience at a much double that at least, or even triple that. Um, the AGU is doing a little bit better in the fact that they are able to recruit a higher percentage of women um, membership. So you can see that they are up to nearly 30%. But again, um, this is the American Geophysical Union. You can see that the percentage of women that are receiving technical awards uh, is below the percentage of the female membership, except for 2020. So hopefully um, they will improve going forward. And then we have the Geological Society of America. So overall, they're doing um, much better. So even though their female membership is hovering you know, above 30, which is higher than any of the other two organizations, they are awarding uh, women at much higher rates, at rates in which they should. So for me, my logic behind this and why this is a good thing, uh, there was an argument in some of our peer reviews that this was like, perhaps could be interpreted as an over-representation. But if you think of it, you know, women, they're getting awards in the amount at which they're graduating at. And you know the, the GSA should be trying to recruit more women. And I think by awarding, giving women awards in relatively equal numbers, or at least the numbers at which they're graduating from geology in, if you have an organization that is fair and equitable in that way, you're gonna draw, hopefully over time, your women membership up and you're gonna give women a reason to wanna be a part of this organization. So even though there is some debate behind this, I do think that they're, um, they're doing the right thing and trying to overall improve um, the gender issue within this organization and geology as a whole. So within our paper, we had a call to action section. So this was basically equivalent to a discussion. And this was a call to action. So very, um, some more tangible than others, things that we wanted the AAPG um, to consider and to look at and to hopefully address going forward. So the main thing is that um, eliminating sexual harassment, discrimination, and microaggressions. There is um, a procedure to report all of this, but I'm not sure if this is common in other fields, but within petroleum geology, a lot of times what happens is if you report someone for any of these type of activities, you're actually, um, and they, anybody finds out, um, you consider what is to be blacklisted. So it's basically where you are prevented from uh, getting a job in the future. Um, people may gossip about you. You may not get advanced. You may get laid off. Um, all of things which I've heard stories about. So there is a tendency to underreport or not report any of these um, issues, which are extremely common at conferences and field trips, and especially when alcohol is involved. Uh, another initiative that um, actually has already been implemented is, uh, we call it JEDI within our organization. Uh, it's called Justice, Equity, Diversity, and Inclusion. And this is training for members, um, individuals in leadership, pos leadership positions, and staff members. So they've actually already hosted um, a training session, and it was given by a specialist. And then also um, women need to be nominated for awards and positions in significant and higher numbers by their peers. 
This organization also needs to undergo a cultural transformation and then also um, a mentoring program. In the literature, it states that um, mentoring can often be the best way to improve diversity and inclusion uh, within organizations and companies. Um, and that, of course, is with the appropriate type of mentorship, the positive, um, the mentors and the sponsors that support the advancement of women and minorities. So that is often the most effective way to have your cultural transformation. I was actually just reading a bunch of literature on that over the weekend. So I was, I was fascinated by that. So it's just good advice for anyone else who's looking to improve their organizations. So to date, these have been our efforts. So over the holidays, I worked with a small subgroup uh, within the network and we generated a consortium proposal. And with that consortium proposal, we have generated over 40,000 US in funds to date. We have used those funds uh, to create and implement a successful online mentoring program. So it's basically, um, we work with a third party, they provide their platform and their algorithm to match people. And then we complete and monitor the matches and just let the relationships uh, grow organically. So we received really good feedback for the pilot that we ran from January through the end of April. Um, also, I had mentioned this, we did have um, a first session or implementation of a JEDI program. So it was given by a specialist. So we paid someone to come in and give this online um, JEDI program. Also coming up for our annual meeting, we have a uh, sponsorship of the Picture a Scientist, which I'm sure a lot of you have already seen. So we will be hosting a face-to-face -face luncheon and a networking session afterward. And then we are also hosting a series of special sessions uh, at our upcoming annual meeting. One of them, uh, we are able to get a special speaker contract her to give a session on resilience. And then um, also the money is going to pay for our current and upcoming research efforts and publication costs associated with that research. So we've already uh, begun to generate ideas for a next publication that we would like um, to send out at some point. Um, and then lastly, one thing that I also had worked on over the holidays is I created an online database of uh, women's resumes and their previous award history. And we are using and keeping that database evergreen and using that information to nominate uh, women within our field for upcoming awards and positions. And the reason I highly suggest that, you know, organizations do something like this is it just makes it easy to nominate people. If you kind of take out the step of, okay, I need to contact this person, I need their resume, all these things, if you have all of this on file and you have people um, maintaining it and watching it and making sure um, they know who has access to it and just for confidentiality reasons and stuff like that, it can be a very powerful and effective way to ensure that you're um, doing your part by nominating. With that being said, it doesn't necessarily mean that women will be you know, equally represented, which is the issue we've had within our organization, but um, I think that it's a really good uh, starting point. So yeah, oh yeah, there's my other kitten. So we're trying to do a lot of good things. <laughs> All right, so this is the last part of the talk. So I just wanted to share with you, um, I know there's a lot of text on the slide and generally that's not something that's advised for giving a presentation, but I just wanted to keep these up because these are some of the peer reviews that we have received. Um, these are leaders, past leaders within our organization. Um, the, the reviewers that were chosen are all white. They are all probably 60 and older. So for whatever reason, the head editor chose a very specific demographic uh, to review this work. So that'll hopefully give you just a little bit of um, reference for why these comments read the way they do, but I think they're very, very telling. Um, so the first thing that piece of information that we received is that uh, this work is polarizing. So um, they think that it is destructive for our organization to bring these things to light for AAPG and for within, within the oil and gas industry. Um, we also were told that the tone of the paper, which I wrote the tone of the paper, um, it's very matter of fact, if you've had the chance to read it. Um, 
she another woman who was a past president actually she was very put off and she was concerned about how you know the tone would affect how a white man would feel um another statement that we had is that we are ignorant of how the organization functions yet most of us have been members for 10 to 15 plus years so if we are ignorant it's somehow our fault yet the usually what that means is that it's actually the organ how the organization is run is failing its membership the members should understand and know how it's working and why certain things happen and if they don't it is not really the fault of the member so um we were really surprised to see that um and then lastly just another sort of comment through here is that the paper came off as being a rant um but again it was going back to the tone that they just didn't like the way that the paper was written so going back to this, um, a lot of these comments are actually um, a form of discrimination referred to as tone policing. So this is something that I'm starting to put together to send to the editor uh, for reasons why I would not like to change the tone of our paper. Um, basically, when people are telling you to modify your tone, um, this is essentially criticizing a person for expressing emotion. And when someone does that, it's basically detracting from the point that the paper is trying to make. So it's attacking the tone rather than presenting um, logical and data-driven answers, uh, addressing the data within the paper. So at no point was the data itself addressed within this paper. It was basically the delivery. Um, this sort of had started when uh, originally, I think it goes, it goes back to the early 1900s, but it's rooted in uh, when people would criticize uh, feminists and perhaps even autistic people for the way that they presented themselves and the type or the way um, that they engaged in arguments. And um, I like this fourth bullet a lot because I think, um, or I'm sorry, the fifth bullet because I think what it does is it really this is what it says to me what tone policing is to me in this situation is basically these it prioritizes the comfort of the privileged person which are the you know the 60 plus white people in the organization it com puts comfort into their privileged position over the oppression of the disadvantaged person so that is one major topic that we are addressing and taking away from our peer reviews. In addition, um, so at the same time, in tandem with this work, we were also trying to elevate um, our status within this organization. So we have been a special interest group, which basically doesn't have a budget. They don't have any attention. Well, we have all this money. We need a budget. Um, we need to work with the staff members. We need to engage with the leadership about our uh, initiatives and our incentives, things like that. And the most opposition from us um, advancing forward within this organization has actually come from women. Uh, this is referred to, this is a common phenomenon that actually isn't really talked about a whole lot. It's quite controversial. I think it makes a lot of people uncomfortable, but this is referred to as horizontal hostility. And this is when you have members within a targeted group behave or act on or enforce the dominant sy system of discrimination and oppression. And this is all, again, coming from white women that are um, much older than the women within the APG Women's Network, except for one that we have with us. Um, so they have been a, describing, a driving force of discrimination towards a lot of our efforts. And I just have um, some of the emails and things that they have made publicly available on the website. So some, some comments that they have. Um, and then also, this was also published online as well, publicly available. So um, you can just see that, you know, again, they don't think that women should have a voice, essentially. Um, I just thought it was really interesting. And I was hesitant to share it, but I, I think that this would have been a, um, a friendly group that I could sort of share some of these sentiments with. Uh, the main thing I think to take away from like the overarching theme within the horizontal hostility that has taken place is 
women who are older, who um, they basically feel that they have gone through a lot more than we have. They didn't have the perks, perks, if you will, um, to help them get to the finish line. So they had to work harder, suffer more, suffer longer, et cetera, et cetera. And because um, they survived that adversity for so long that um, making this uh, or elevating our status to a division and, you know, giving women equity, if you will, is somehow a problem because that devalues everything that they have gone through um, in their careers. The other component to that is some women, especially now 2021, they simply believe that discrimination doesn't exist. They, because they had experienced it so much in like the 70s and 80s, that form of discrimination, and, and to a certain degree, I, I agree with them, like the type of discrimination that women faced in the 70s and 80s and 90s, I think is somewhat fundamentally different than the discrimination that women face today. But just because it's different doesn't mean it's still there. I think it's very different. And now that everything is online, I think that that adds a whole nother component of discrimination and things that women have to deal with that maybe they never were, it was never even a part of like reality for women in the 60s and 70s and 80s. So basically they're saying that to them, they just don't see there being discrimination anymore. So why would you need a special network uh, to support women if, you know, in their minds, discrimination is gone? So those are some of the main arguments. And then the last thing, um, so this we just found out about a week ago. Um, we found out that this organization and many of the organizations within the petroleum geoscience field is actually going under and do for obvious reasons. Um, you know, in the US, we're having a huge green energy movement, which is really exciting and wonderful. And I'm I first merger. So APG and SPE, which is the Society of Petroleum Engineers are exploring um, a merger to come together and create a new organization. Uh, generally, the SP is more progressive than our APG organization. So for us, we view this as being a very positive merger. Um, but at the same time, we aren't really sure how this is going to impact our network and our future activities. So this is a huge sort of question mark. Nobody really knows what this is going to look like. But this is something that will likely happen within the next year. Because if it doesn't, um, the organization that we're a part of will likely go bankrupt in the near future. And then uh, the last thing that I just want to leave you with, um, I talked about a lot of really important, um, probably a lot of things that are hard to hear for some people in this talk, but I did wanna leave you with something really positive. And that is basically that you need to be the change you wish to see in the world. So even though you may have your paper rejected or your grant rejected and you know it was for like unethical reasons and things that are out of your control, for example, or let's say you don't get that promotion or you get laid off, um, don't let it stop you. Even though we didn't uh, get our division status, it was voted down, um, we are still going to act as if it went through um, from like a, a mental perspective. So we are going to continue pressing forward and we are creating um, the reality that we want to see and we want to expand within other organizations in geology and even beyond. So even if your environment isn't exactly um, where you want to be or the type of environment you want to be in, try to do your best to create that environment within you. And I think if you approach it from positivity, you'll really be able to change. You can be the catalyst for change around you and you can start affecting people around you from just your positivity. Um, so yeah, that's the last thing I wanted to leave you with today. So thank you thank so much. Thank you very much. Um, I will yeah, you're welcome. Um, if you have any questions, I'd be happy to hear we have rep. 1045. Yeah, I can take some questions or we can go through the ones that are in the chat. 
Oh, yeah, I might um, read out some of the ones that are in the chat. Uh, and if people have more questions, you can enter them in the chat or you can just yell out um, when, when you feel like it. Uh, so um, Caroline says that she 110% agrees that the numbers are dismal and we need to do something about it. I do wonder if there's any value on calculating the percentage of male, female, minority awardees, executive members, et cetera, as a weighted percentage rather than using the raw numbers. Um, not a comment on the presentation, but also just with work that she's involved in at the moment. Um, she hasn't run these numbers yet, but she's interested in people's thoughts on that. Did you have? Oh, sorry. Yeah. Are you, did you Caroline, get... were you, sorry, it kind of, it cut out, but I've been reading it. Um, um, Caroline, would you mind explaining your thoughts behind this one? Um, oh, it's because um, when we look at the number of, let's say, awardees in a society, um, and we kind of, I don't know about you, but I want to say that, like, you know, half of awards go to women and half go to mm -hmm. men. Women in the society mm -hmm. might only be, say, 25% then is it actually, is it a reasonable expectation that we should be thinking that we would like to see the awards going 50-50 mm -hmm. men, women? Or should we actually be thinking, no, it should actually be 25-75? Mm -hmm. It's just, yeah, I, I don't know what other people think of that as well. It's just something that's been going through my head lately is that are we actually presenting the data in a completely truthful way? Mm -hmm. Is there someone? Yeah. Okay, that was just something else. Yeah, no, I think that's really good. That that we've um, we've had the same conversations, and yeah, we've been thinking the same thing as you: how to do it the 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 right way. What would be best? Yeah. And are, are you able to give a, a sort of a short summary of the? Yeah, so I can go back. Um, I think. Can you still see my screen? This yeah. is yeah. the one that I think probably addresses that where we had the weighted, where the, we had the female membership uh, percentage in the gray bar. Maybe it's just hard the way that this graph is displayed. We, we did this graph like 10 different ways to try to get it to, to make the most sense. But where you see the gray against the green, that's where you're meeting the, the number of females within the organization as a whole. So you're sort of meeting expectations. Um, and then where you see it in red is where the awardees are much less. So I would say that if you think that um, depending on the organization that it should, you should try to get it in the green, but you can see like the GSA down at the bottom, the green is like way higher. So maybe that's, that's not necessarily fair if you only have like 32 mm -hmm. to 35% of uh, women in the organization, then 50% are receiving the award for that year. Is that really, um, is that appropriate? So yeah, that's definitely a discussion that we've had. Um, me personally, women, female numbers are low in these organizations. They're low compared to the rates at which women are employed and they graduate. So I mean, for me, I think that in order to increase women membership, you need to award more women numbers than maybe the percentage if you want to try to drive the overall rates up. Um, I know that's a big discussion we've had is how do you define equity? What is considered fair and equitable? Um, I don't know if I have a really good answer for that. So it's a hard yeah, one. Interesting, interesting um, overview of the conversations though. So yeah, I agree. It's like, there's no, there's no definite answer. So, but it's a, at least it's a conversation that I think is just worth having and worth thinking mm -hmm. about. Yeah, thanks. Yep. Mm -hmm. Because the reason I think it's important and things that I've actually personally experienced um, is sort of in a different way is when you have these numbers down at the bottom, like you see at the GSA, where you have a much higher percentage of women receiving awards, that's often when women will face retaliation for that. So if, if you are um, creating this, maybe you have good intentions, but could you actually be causing some form of retaliation towards 
the female population for actually earning more awards way beyond the membership number. So I think that's something to consider because I see this happen with women and then also with minorities um, that all the minorities that you know are all being given higher positions because there's so few of them and then they end up facing retaliatory remarks. Um, there are people who get nasty with them, microaggressions, you know, things like that. So I, those are both things that I've seen and things that I think we need to really think about and be aware of when we're, why it's the why part of it, why it's important, you know, what we're deciding is equitable and what is fair. Okay, so I'm just going through the comments um, on questions in the chat. So um, Kate asks if you could share a link to the page that has the resumes of women in the yeah. AAPG for award nominations. Yep. Yeah. She also sure. asked for a link to the manuscript. Then she later says that it's still under review. So we'll look forward to seeing that once it's... Um... Oh, here, I actually, I have the link to the manuscript and it's on oh, Earth sure. Archive. So I'm not sure if you guys do the preprint stuff. Yeah, um, it's catching on a bit more. That's fantastic. Yeah, yeah. I really, I, I love it. Um, yeah. Here, I'll just get it for you real quick. Perfect. Um, and I'll keep going through. So Lorna um, says the slides on comments from peer reviews is absolutely shocking. I feel this actually echoes their ignorance. Could you view this as a call to write a much more ranty manuscript? <laughs> I think that sounds like a good idea. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, that was a you know, pretty shocking comment. And, um, in that yeah. Sorry, I lost my spot. Okay, yep. Could you view this as a call to write a much more ranty manuscript? Yeah, <laughs> I, I actually, so I spoke to several past presidents about it and they told me probably the best way is to have the, the introduction be refined and like tone police myself for the intro. And then they said that the, the discussion or the call to action may be the most appropriate place to go off on the rant <laughs> part of it. So um, that's one thing that I think we're gonna, we might take that advice and do that. So basically they said, you wanna suck them in, get them to read it. And then they're already committed, you know, three fourths of the paper through. And then that's the time at which you, you express truly how you feel. So yeah, it's, it's very complicated. <laughs> yeah, for sure. Absolutely. Um, Caroline posted a link to an article that you might have seen on Twitter um, a few days ago. On the, it was published in the conversation. It was about mm. um, men mentoring um, women and it was prop propping up patriarchal structures. Did you see that article? I did not. No, I'll definitely read it. Thank you for sharing it was pretty, that. It was really... Um, controversial I thought and I thought of that when I saw when you talked about the mentoring because it well I don't know if it's controversial but it was interesting research it showed that um when the sort of the people who've already been through the system are telling you or telling you know early career people how to operate within that same system it keeps propping up this same thing so yeah it was really I was it kind of blew my mind a bit um mm -hmm. so um Helen writes um comment I heard from an older woman in science recently was along the lines of previously women were wanting to show that they could achieve equally with men and didn't want special treatment but now looking back she thought that there hasn't been much progression as a result and perhaps more gender equity initiatives earlier on would have meant that we had uh, would have already progressed further now in terms of award nominations etc is there consideration of a relative to opportunity component like along the lines of um, the rope statement in the ARC grants. I'm not sure if you're familiar with that. That's um, um, yeah, relative to opportunity, what your achievements have been. I guess it takes into account things like um, you know um, time away from research due to mm. carers leave, and yeah, do they take that into account with um, nominations for the AOPG awards? Oh no, not in America. <laughs> no, yeah, you get like. like six weeks of maternity leave legally here and mm -hmm. eight weeks if you have a c-section so it's like fundamental rooted within our policies within our government are very female unfriendly so that just carries over into all other facets of life if you will yeah yeah absolutely that's crazy um 
Hannah writes, um, great talk, keep the conversation going, love your efforts. Are you aware of any Australian professional societies undertaking this kind of research? Well, I think maybe that was Indrani who wrote that, but yeah. Um, I didn't know that. I'll check it out. Yeah. Uh, yeah, I think what Mesa's doing has got some statistics on this in the um, paper by Hanley et al. published last year about um, women in professional societies as well. Um, yeah, that paper's got a bunch of um, numbers from the Geological Society of Australia in it. Perfect. Yeah. Yep. Yeah, and we're going to cite that one in our uh, peer review. Excellent. Um, so Vanessa writes, our discussions in our professional society for the time being is that the awardee proportion should reflect the gender breakdown or the underrepresented, underrepresented group breakdown percent of your membership. So that was going back to that discussion you were having before mm -hmm. um, with Carolyn. Um, okay, Kate writes, regarding the manuscript reviews, totally agree that reviews are harsh and unnecessary and it's interesting to learn about the tone policing. Yeah, I was interested in that too. While I totally agree you should be able to write in whatever tone you like, my thought is that to have the best chance to convince the people who aren't already convinced of the importance of change, then perhaps a tone that would please the reviewers might result in the paper um, message being more impactful. Mm -hmm. That's the advice we've been given as well. Yep. So I think, um, as I mentioned earlier, I think we'll do that for the intro part on the background. And then at the very end is when we'll um, allow ourselves to be a little bit more colorful. Yeah. Um, Alana um, writes, to eliminate discrimination or sexual harassment, what do you think about the implement implementation of introductory trainings and bystander intervention? Um, to these issues in mandatory health and safety briefings. This is an idea I've been discussing with colleagues to encourage people who don't want to acknowledge this. We thought of this with an analogy that helps those who don't yet recognise discrimination or sexual harassment. We hope we don't see, a, and this is the analogy, we hope we don't see a fire and have to deal with one, but we're still trained in health and safety on what to do. In the same way, people might not see discrimination harassment every day, but understanding that this is an issue and how to be an ally and make positive bystander intervention is essential. Yeah, I think this is a great idea. I actually, um, when I was on the board of the AWG in 2017, the past president, um, Blair Schneider, she had created some of these. She received a big NSF fund in the US to create this type of training. And um, I tried back in 2017 to ask this, or I did ask the APGR organization if she could come and give that training. And they basically said, no, we don't care. And that was in 2017. Um, they did have a training about a month ago addressing this. I'm not, I wasn't able to attend. So I'm not sure um, how many people within that organization attended the one that they just had about a month ago. But typically what happens is the people who are already um, aware of it <laughs> are the ones that go to it and the ones that really need it don't show up so that's the the only issue that we've had um, within the APG but I think it's a great idea it's I mean it's a great place to start yeah absolutely um, yeah it's such a tricky issue Alana did you have anything else you wanted to say about that yeah, hi, thanks so much for the talk, hi. Michelle. That's really interesting. Um, I'm joining here from Switzerland. It's like 6 30 in the morning. So it's, oh, cool. <laughs> it's really worth meeting up. So it's really happy. Yeah. Um, yeah, it's just something that I've discussed with colleagues, and there is so much of an issue that we are often in these rooms um, talking to people who are already very aware of the issues. And um, this is one thought that yeah, myself and colleagues have had that make trying to make it part of mandatory health and safety. And because it, it is a thing that affects um, not just individuals, but also, like you said, like workplace culture, and that has to change. And I think, like, so our group here in Bern, we're organizing an unconscious bias training this week and um, really excited for it. But we also only had, like, kind of a small percentage of the faculty sign up to do that course. And um, we, like, kind of had to really encourage more to do that. And, um, I just think that that would be, if it's possible in the future to try and get that into some sort of mandatory form of information and training, that that, would, that could have a huge impact. Um, mm -hmm. Yeah, <laughs> but it's good I to hear about. Um, yeah, I, I think it's a great idea. I did pose to the executive committee earlier this year that basically if you're a leader within the organization, it's mandatory 
like HR training that you would take at your university or your company to get paid. And basically the response was that, well, because you know, in America, we're all worried about infringing on your rights. <laughs> so it was basically could have, it, some people would view it as like an infringement of their rights to force them to take this training. And that was the response that we had received from that. And it was just like, yeah, so, <laughs> yeah. Oh. but it's baby steps. I think you have to sort of mm, really be conscious of how you're you're pitching it to them it's it's just hard yeah but we did yeah, have, I mean I people like are listening. <laughs> yeah and, and one thing I did notice I have noticed is some of the older men within our organization so the retired men have actually turned all whole new leaf because they have daughters and they clearly went home and talked to their daughters about this and their daughters must have agreed with our stances and you, we have seen several of them that were pretty harsh and critical of us a year ago. They have completely turned a new leaf and now they're like our biggest sponsors and support because their daughters are really fighting for us as well. So that has been something positive to come out of it, even though it's maybe not something we can put in a paper or whatever, but it kind of helps. It helps you feel like you're, you're having an impact at some level. So yeah, sure. Yeah, it's crazy that it should take having a daughter for, to, for people to appreciate someone else's point of view. But I, yeah, that's, I think our prime minister recently said something similar. Anyway, um, yes. Okay, well, I think we'll um, wrap it up because we've hit three o'clock or 11 p.m. where you are, Rochelle. So thank yeah. you so much for that. Yeah. Um, yeah, but um, yeah, I just want to thank you once again for uh, being a June speaker um, and uh, for doing such um, amazing work on this issue, such an important issue as well. Yep. Thank you all so much. I wish you the best of luck. And please, if there's anything I can do to help anybody, just let me know. Thank you very much. And I'll uh, copy those links and I'll put them um, on the WMESA webpage as well if anyone hasn't managed to um, to copy and paste those across as well. So, okay, thanks a lot. Yep, bye-bye, take care.